I, I want to understand a little bit more what you think is driving that sense of peace, because it can only be described as a sense of peace. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I have to say, I don't personally feel peace in that way, right? If I, if I try to imagine this being the last year of my life, uh, there's no, there, there, there's, I wouldn't take a positive thought from it. I mean, I, I, I would be, I'd be very sad. And you could say, well, Peter, that's because you're 50 and Walter's 85. Maybe, but I would bet that there are a lot of 85 year olds who also wouldn't have much peace knowing that they're at the end. And how do you reconcile the peace that you can have at the end of your life with the fact that you undoubtedly have more to do? Because to me, that's the struggle. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that question. First of all, I think there is a difference between being 50 and being 85. Uh, I was on the island of Corsica, and I literally was on a cruise, taken off the cruise, and had to be operated on immediately in a clinic. If they didn't, I would have died. And I said in my 60s, just give me a little more time. I promise I'll be of service. I had already been of service, had no intention of doing anything else, haven't done any business in the last 30 years. All I've been has been in service. So that was not a big commitment. It was a natural commitment, and I bought more time. I think if we don't turn on the flashlight to bring light on what we've been blessed with, there is no opportunity to get much fulfillment at the end for the gratitude that these blessings have provided. So in a sense, it's to your point, which is whether, and it relates to whether you're saving money for your kid's college. If you wait till they're junior in high school, it's tough. Hmm. Not much time. If you want to save for retirement, if you wait until your 60s, it's really tough. If you want to start being grateful, and you want to wait till your 80s, it's really tough. But if you can build that, which I hope I'm building in millions of young people, this awareness and expression of gratitude is not just awareness, it's expression of gratitude because they will be enriched by expressing it and the person receiving it will be. So I actually think, and my dream and my hope, is when I say the word pay it forward, most people know what I'm talking about. They know the concept of pay it forward means if somebody does something nice for you, you in turn will do something nice for three people, not necessarily have to do something for the person who was nice to you. I want Say It Now to become as ubiquitous, as common as that. And someone says, you know, I need to do a Say It Now for Gene. I need to do a Say It Now for Peter. I believe that will elevate our own sense of value. I want to make the other point. It may be helpful to you and others. I always want to get done with this project before I go. But I came to two conclusions during this last finishing strong exercise. One was that I never wanted to leave my wife a widow. We've been married 60 years, never wanted her. I work out every day, almost every day, most every day, because I wanted to outlive my wife. I came to the realization, that is not for me to decide. That's going to just be what it is. You can do the best, but if she's a widow, just take care of her as you would want her taken care of and relax. Have peace. Have peace. So the other thing was, I got to finish the project. And I said, Walder, you've been doing projects for the last 30 years. And you're not going to stop doing projects. So you, by definition, will die with an unfinished symphony. That is the nature of your life. And don't stop just so you could finish. Yeah, I, I think back to one of the other friends that Rick introduced us to, 
at the event, um, which was the gentleman who was a little over a hundred years old right. and who, who's still, who's still working on deals. He's still talking to Rick about business ideas and just, he's, it's like, he, it's like he's 50 years old. Yeah. Um, and I really think, you know, it's, it's impossible to, to prove these things scientifically because you can't do randomized controlled experiments. So we'll never truly know the causative nature of having a purpose in longevity, mm -hmm. right? But it's very hard for me to believe that there isn't causality there, meaning that the people who continue to have a purpose in life, and again, your purpose for the past 30 years hasn't been to make a dime. It's been in this say it now movement. Uh, for some people, their purpose in life is public service through politics. For some people, it is indeed working in the private sector. Uh, the, the point is, I think the people who continue to have some sense of purpose that is far beyond their se themselves and their own joy and pleasure um, undoubtedly seem to live longer. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if people, you know, I was thinking today of the word pastime. <laughs> well, pastime, you know, well, it helps pass time. And I, it takes my breath away when somebody says that. <laughs> past time. Wow. For me, it's purpose time. You give me time, it's purpose time. Um, and and I, I can't imagine not living that way, but I don't suggest that everybody will live that way. I can only suggest that for me, it's given me an extraordinary life and it didn't start when I was 80. It didn't start when I was 70. It started when I was in my 20s. Yeah, and I, and I, and I don't want to suggest that, that the purpose of a person's life needs to be as grand as your ambition or, you know, starting a new business. Um, it can be simply taking care of another person. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly struck. You know, one of the things I do with all of our patients is take a detailed family history before we start. I can't tell you the number of times I go through the family history and we're talking about their grandparents and they'll say, you know, one of them died from some disease and the other one died very shortly thereafter, despite being completely healthy. They just lost interest in life. And they would, they describe it to me as they died of a broken heart mm -hmm. or they just stopped thriving. Um, and I think that's an extension of this as well. I think having yeah. having that other person there is is part of purpose. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Peter, you really not only are you making these keen and important observations. I just want to take a moment to say, you know, you work really hard at this, and you need to know just on behalf of those people who have read your book. Unfortunately, I had to choose just one chapter because I'm only a one chapter guy. Of course, I'd choose the one on emotional health that I thought was, to me, it was the door to you. It was the one that proved to me you're really authentic and the person that I wanted to connect with. And I think your conversations that you're having carry that chapter 17 with you in all that you do and that you are enriching lives of millions of people through your writings and through your podcasts and through your good work. And um, I personally just wanted to acknowledge you for that. And I wanted to just piggyback the thing. Um, you know, after 60 years of marriage, best decision I ever made. And nobody ever helped us being a good husband. Nobody ever helped us. And for sure, we didn't have great models. My father died, as I've described. So I didn't have a good model. So where do you learn it from? The most important decision in our life, we have no training for, as I mentioned earlier, nor with kids. But one of the things that is amazing to me, and I'm getting very respectful of why so many marriages don't last. And that is, there are so many stages. I described three stages of my life. But in marriage, you've got the uh, dating, you've got the uh, marriage with no kids, then you got the kids, and then the kids leave the house, and then you retire, and then 
the last chapter is one of them slows down a little bit. So I am married to an Energizer bunny who's slowing down a little. And during the pandemic, I got a chance to love her in a way that I never did before. And that's another thing you never know. You always know you love the person you married. The question is, can you always love the person equally or more when they're not quite the same person you married? And I want to suggest that Lola's still super active, but she's not as active as she used to be. So um, this is to your point, is I love caring for her when she needs it. I love it. And I do think that story that you just mentioned is to the extent to which we are so self-focused. I don't know if you can die from it, but you won't live from it. You won't live a long life from it. And I think it's the focus on others that provides me with my energy. I said to myself during this recent challenge, don't take anything away from me that'll prevent me from helping others. I refuse that treatment. I'll take as long as I have as long as I could be helpful to others.